going to um, just give you a whistle stop tour um, around the Bats of Exmoor today, um, much more uh, general than Fiona's excellent talk. Um, right, so Exmoor basically is a landscape of contrast. It has a mosaic of habitats, uh, all combined within a relatively small area. Oops. Not quite sure what's happening here. There we go. Um, so we have open moorland, uh, uh, which is combined with steep sided coombs and cleaves. Uh, these are often wooded or scrubbed uh, with rivers or streams linking the moorland to the wider area. Uh, we have uh, extensive deciduous woodlands. Uh, in fact, Exmoor is one of the uh, more highly wooded parts of Somerset. Um, and these are also associated uh, frequently, frequently with steep sided, sheltered, uh, wooded river valleys. Exmoor has an extensive coastline, um, much of which again is wooded with coombs and cleaves extending inland. We have a small area of coastal marsh and also lowland heathland. And typical of Exmoor are these uh, hedge banks, steep sided stone, often stone faced hedge banks, um, which can be managed or unmanaged. On the open moorland, they've often grown out into tree lines, uh, beaches typical of these um, on the higher ground. Uh, and it's a very rural park with numerous small villages, hamlets and farms, uh, traditional vernacular buildings that you can see here. Um, so this combines really to make a habitat that's, that's very good for bats. It offers high quality foraging habitat, uh, wooded river valleys and deciduous woodland, for example. There are abundance of roosting sites, uh, not only in the vernacular buildings, um, a lot of the buildings are Victorian or pre-Victorian as well. Uh, we have a lot of mature timber here, uh, trees with associated damage that provide cavities and crevices for um, tree roosting species. And there's good con connectivity about these. I was interested that Fiona spoke, spoke about, spoke about uh, the country lanes. Um, because our country lanes are bordered by these hedge banks, providing they're not lit and they're often unlit, they do provide really good corridors um, for bats that are commuting, but also for foraging um, because they are, they're sheltered. So the bat can go either side of the hedge or actually down the lane itself. So in terms of um, species of bat, um, as Nigel mentioned, the UK has uh, currently has 17 resident and breeding species. Um, and 16 of these have been recorded on Exmoor. Uh, 13, at least 13 uh, are known or likely to breed here. So it's a very rich area for bats. Uh, the only exception that we haven't found is in uh, Somerset yet, and certainly not on Exmoor, is the Alcatoe. This is a species that was only very recently discovered um, in Europe, in fact, as a cryptic species. So uh, it closely resembles two other myota species that occur here, Whiskered and Brants, um, both of which do occur on, on Exmoor. Um, and it was only really uh, identified, as I say, in, in the UK in, in 2010, although almost certainly it's been here longer, it's probably a resident, and it's woodland specialist, so there's no reason to believe uh, it hasn't occurred here, um, but because you can't identify it easily from the call, uh, or even when you have the bat in the, the hand, because it resembles uh, these other myota species so closely, uh, it's often necessary to catch them and, and to confirm the identity by taking droppings and then uh, getting those DNA analysed. So this shows a, um, that's a horseshoe flying inside a root void. Uh, and this is one of the interesting features about bats in, in general, um, is that they're the only mammal with powered flight. Um, bats are actually uh, incredibly successful group of animals. Uh, there are uh, well over 1400 species throughout the world, um, almost a quarter of the world's mammal species. Um, power of flight certainly um, is one of the factors that, is, that has helped with their success. Uh, 
So the rings are formed basically from the elongated finger bones with a very thin, flexible and strong wing uh, membrane stretched between these. Uh, in addition to powered flight, uh, they're the only terrestrial mammal that can use echolocation. Um, and this is echolocation is basically high frequency sound pulses, which are generated by the larynx, the voice box, and emitted through the mouth or the nose. Um, and it allows that to build up a, a picture, a uh, sound picture of its surroundings. And if you have a bat detector and you tune it to the right frequency, uh, this is what you'll hear. So each of these notes is a wave of sound that is sent out, hits an object, in this case an insect, bounces back to the bat, and it can determine with some accuracy how long, how, how far away that insect is, how large it is. Um, and so the event, the essentially use echolocation to, to both navigate and to, to find prey. The other characteristic feature of bats is that they hibernate in the winter periods. So um, <clears throat> bats can go into torpor and hibernation, and this allows them to uh, occupy areas that are otherwise unsuitable, for example, um, because they have a very seasonal food supply. So torpor is essentially controlled lowering of the body temperature uh, accompanied by reduced breathing rates and heart rate. And hibernation um, <clears throat> is essentially prolonged periods of deep torpor. Uh, these lesser horseshoe bats here are roosting in a tunnel. Um, and like all bat species, they will periodically rouse throughout the, the winter uh, to feed um, or to drink, or sometimes just to excrete metabolic products. Uh, horseshoe bats amongst our, our bats um, are actually quite active during the winter, and they frequently wake up and move position within the roost to sort of find the, the ideal uh, temperature and relative humidity conditions. Um, it's energetically costly for them to, to um, rouse from hibernation. <clears throat> and so disturbance of hibernating bats um, can be a real issue if they're low on food reserves uh, and they're burning up those, um, those fat reserves essentially to, to wake up. This can be the difference between an animal surviving hibernation uh, or, or not, particularly if, if we have a prolonged um, prolonged winter or, or conversely a milder winter where periodically they, they wake up and look for food but can't forage because it's, it's too cold and wet for insect activity. Um, so just uh, as an aside actually before I start talking about pipistrels, um, another characteristic of bats is that they're very long-lived. Um, if I go back to the horseshoes, um, this is tied in with hibernation because it used to be thought that uh, the reason they were unusually long-lived for their body size was a, was a function of um, hibernation, but in fact uh, it doesn't actually explain um, the longevity of these species because um, bats that don't hibernate, for example, fruit bats, uh, are also very long-lived. Um, so bats are unusual in that they're very small mammals um, that actually have the life history strategy of a much larger mammal. They have a low reproductive rate. They only produce in the UK at least one pup every year. Uh, they don't breed in every year, um, but they're very long-lived. Uh, so it's thought that their low fecundity may be a consequence of flight because it's so energetically costly. Uh, they can only produce relatively small numbers of young at a time. Um, and this would explain why they live so long, but it wouldn't actually explain how they achieve this process. Uh, so, put, so put this in context, a house mice, which house mouse, which weighs about 22 grams, will only live for about three years. These lesser horseshoe here um, weigh no more than nine grams, uh, but they can live for up to 18 years. Uh, that's a record from the species at the moment. Uh, greater horseshoe bats, uh, which are one of our largest species, still only weigh 34 grams. They can live for up to 31 years. And as far as I know, the record is still held by a Siberian brants, although this may have changed, um, uh, which was recorded as being 41 years old. A lot of this data comes from ringing studies uh, and repeat captures of bats. 
So what about saying most likely to counter on Exmoor? Uh, the ones that roost in buildings uh, are the frequently the ones that people most often come across. Uh, we have two species uh, breeding on Exmoor, common soprano pipstrel. We do record an enthusiast uh, pipstrel, which is a much rarer species, uh, although I don't know of any colonies. Um, on Exmoor, it tends to be uh, found uh, in North Somerset more commonly. Um, pipistrels can use buildings without leaving any evidence of their presence. They tend not to use roof, void, roof voids. They tend to use little cavities like the one indicated here. We've got a gap between the, the roof tiles and the edge of the roof and the slide in, in, in between that small gap. If you can get a couple of fingers into that gap, a bat can get into there. And they'll sit on the wall top uh, or they'll move into the batting cavities between the, the tiles and slates or the felt. Um, and you won't even know that they're there. Unlike rodents, they, they don't chew wiring, they don't cause damage, they don't make nests, they do leave droppings behind. Um, so with small numbers of bats, this is not usually an issue. Um, however, some roosts are very large. Um, soprano pipistrels can roost, roost sizes can reach several hundred or even thousand plus bats. Uh, this is the largest colony I've come across um, anywhere, but particularly on Exmoor. I know there are probably larger colonies elsewhere. And what you can see here, the, roofs, the uh, roof slates have been taken off this roof. And these are actually bat droppings. The colony at its largest size numbers at least 640 bats. They're quite hard to count coming out because they, when they emerge in the evening, they tend to fly back up to the roost entrance and away again. So you're double counting them all the time. Uh, but we counted at least uh, 640 bats in this maternity colony. So maternity roost is a roost that's used by mothers and pups. Uh, they collect they collect their mothers will get together uh, in May, uh, late April, May, um, and they'll find a roost site. They'll get together, they'll gestate their pups there, give birth to their pups there, nurse their pups until the pups are independent, and then they disperse. Um, so obviously when you have a very large colony like this leaving uh, massive amounts of droppings, uh, it can be problematic. In this case, it was uh, the urine was coming through to the plaster and staining the ceiling. Uh, so in this particular case, we, we dealt with it by lining the batten cavities here with felt. So the felt extended over the rafters um, and then down into the batten cavity and over the next rafter. So we we kind of formed a, a seal between the bats and the and the ceiling underneath uh, so they can live quite happily on top of the felt. Um, we left the roof open at the edge and so the droppings rather than collecting um, here as shown will actually just fall out of the out of the roof and onto a lead valley and where they will break down and disintegrate and the much smaller amount of remains can just be washed away by the rain. Uh, another common bat that people come across um, because they do use uh, roof voids are long-eared bats. Uh, we have both species on Exmoor. Uh, the brown long-eared bat is, is very common. The grey long-eared bat uh, is much rarer um, species and um, in fact is uh, endangered in the UK. Um, you can see from this picture how they get their name from. They have extraordinary long ears. Uh, you can also see the detail of the, the wing very well, with these very long finger bones. Um, so these animals have large ears because they uh, hunt by hearing. Um, they do use calls. The calls are very quiet, um, but they'll actually fly around a shrub and listen for the prey for spiders and, and small insects and just uh, glean them off the, the leaves. Uh, brown long eared bats tend to feed around woodland and woodland edge, but they do like to roost in buildings. Um, and they will also use buildings for breeding. So, here, this is a typical site of a brown long eared maternity colony squashed up uh, against the ridge timber. There, there are probably about half a dozen bats there. Um, sorry, there are probably about a dozen bats there, actually. Um, all you can see is a, a tangle of fur and, and ears. Um, because they have such long ears, actually, the, the bat on the right-hand side 
uh, you can't actually see its ears. It's tucked its ears behind its wings, which they often do when they roost. And so these little protuberances sticking up here are actually not the ears. They're, they're called the tragus. And the tragus is a piece of skin in front of the ear canal, um, which we have in a much reduced form, which helps to direct the sound into the ear. And it's very important for navigation and locating prey. Um, and also the shape and size of the tragus is one of the key um, features we use when identifying species. So as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the general breeding cycle is that the, the females will uh, gather in their maternity roots in May, have the pups in June, the pups are born naked, they fur up very quickly and they can actually start to fly within about three weeks and they're weaned after about six weeks, so a very quick breeding cycle. Uh, unlike the pipistrelles, you, you tend to find a lot of males in brown long-eared co brown long -eared colonies. Um, so grey long-eared bats, much rarer. <clears throat> there is a breeding colony, or there used to be a breeding colony in Dunster Stables, the uh, National Trust uh, property. Uh, we, we don't know what the status of the roost is at, at present. It seems to have declined. Um, one of the factors that probably affects the distribution and success of grey long-eared bats is that their favoured feeding habitat is unimproved uh, grassland and meadows have declined by a huge amount, 97% over the past uh, few years um, or past sort of several decades. Um, so these animals probably actually you know, struggle to find decent foraging habitat in a, in a lot of areas. Interestingly, though, um, recently, in the last couple of years, doing some surveys for the Honeycutt, uh, National Trust Honeycutt Estate, which is west of Dunster, uh, we did actually come across grey long-eared bats, the first time they've been uh, identified actually roosting in a building um, on the estate or in a building that's suitable for roosting. Uh, you can see the bat here is much greyer. It's, is quite distinctively coloured um, compared to the brown long-eared bats. Um, actually, colour is not a, although this is kind of very typical uh, morph of grey long-eared bats, the colour is not a very reliable way of identifying them. So we did take droppings and had them DNA analysed. Um, hopefully, uh, Jack Civita, will, who's be talking about beavers, will also fill us in on a bit of the um, habitat enhancement work that the National Trust is doing on their Honeycutt estate. Um, and I think some of this will probably favour grey long ears, so it'd be very interesting to monitor the situation. Uh, another co common species um, that people frequently come across uh, are the uh, greater horseshoe and national horseshoe bats. Um, these are actually a bit of a success story. Uh, the numbers have increased um, over the last few years. Uh, their range and the population size seems to be increasing uh, largely because of uh, protective measures uh, that have been put in place. Um, all, all UK bats and their roosts are protected and uh, the roosts are protected um, whether the bats are present or not. The reason for that is uh, bat species um, don't tend to use a single roost, they tend to use, have a number of different roosts that they move around uh, according to the time of year the reproductive status and the prevailing weather conditions. Uh, the small animals, they lose heat very readily, so they need to find uh, environmental conditions uh, that are suitable for their, the stage of the life cycle. Um, so horseshoe bats are unusual in that they emit most sound generally to their nose rather than to their mouth. And because of this, they produce a sound that is very distinctive and unique amongst bats. So there's this kind of warbling sound. It sounds a bit like clangers or, or aliens. Um, the roost in large buildings, uh, because unlike other bats, they don't use crevices. Uh, they have to fly into roosts. And so you tend to find them in, in barns or, or um, houses with large lofts where there's actually a sizable entrance that they can fly into. Uh, and they hibernate in cellars. Um, tunnels, mines, sea caves, again, other structures that allow them to, to fly inside. Um, so the greater horseshoe on the, on the left here um, is one of our largest species with a wingspan that can go up to, to 40 centimetres. Conversely, the uh, lesser horseshoe on the 
um, on the right, sorry, the great horseshoe on the left, the uh, horseshoe on the right, is one of our smallest species with a wingspan of uh, 250 centimeters. Um, and this difference in size reflects the kind of prey they take. So a great horseshoe can take quite large beetles, such as chafers and dung beetles. Uh, lesser horseshoe tends to take much smaller insects, a variety of insects, but uh, midges and other flies, small moths, uh, small wasps, spiders, that sort of thing. So bats that are less obvious, but are, oops, I don't think you need to hear the horses again, but are equally characteristic of Exmoor, and kind of a sort of uh, specialist of Exmoor in a way, are these noctil. Um, these are our largest bat species. Um, I've been told that one way you can sort of size bats is if you lay them across the palm of your hand, and noctil you can see are a four-finger bat, so the little Pipistrels and the um, lesser horseshoe bats would sit across two fingers, and uh, the long-eared bats would probably cover about three fingers, just to give you a, a relative indication of size. Being large bats, they can take uh, large prey items, as you can see from these teeth. They would have no problems with sizable um, beetles at all. Uh, they have a very low and loud call, and children, um, can sometimes hear them because the call falls within the range of our hearing. Their calls are uh, below um, 20 kilohertz often, which was in, within the range of human hearing. And you have quite a distinctive chip chop sound. So what you'll hear here is a, is a bat, um, a nocturnal bat for, foraging. They tend to fly, they have long thing wings, they're fast flying bats, they tend to fly quite high and direct. Um, if you see one, if you see a bat that looks, you think is a bird, and then you realize that bat and it's going in a straight line across the sky quite high up, that's almost certainly a noctil. Um, so this call, here's a, a bat uh, foraging. So I think you hear a feeding buzz, which sounds a bit like a raspberry. And then you hear the very distinctive chip chop call that it makes afterwards. It's quite a jazzy syncopated call, I always think. Um, <clears throat> so these are mainly a tree roosting species. They rarely use buildings. This is why we, we rarely see them. Um, and the maternity colonies um, frequently change roost. So uh, if they find an ideal tree, they may stick with it, but often the, the colonies will kind of split up and they'll, they'll move around. So another characteristic uh, species of Exmoor, um, certainly found over this side um, uh, in Horner Wood, uh, are barbastels. Um, these have a call that's described uh, like castanets. I don't know whether you agree. So again, it's quite a rhythmic call. Um, these are moth specialists, and they are called whispering bats. They have a very quiet call. It can be up to 100 times quieter than other bat species. And the reason they seem to have evolved this is that it enables them to hunt moths uh, that have uh, themselves evolved to hear bat calls and develop de defensive strategies to avoid the bats, for example, by folding their wings and dropping out of the sky uh, when they hear a bat coming. Um, so the barbastels um, are kind of stealth feeders in a way. They, they just call very quietly. It does mean that um, an incredibly fast flyer. So I'm not quite sure how they fly, fly so fast without blundering into things, given that the calls are so quiet. Um, but anyway, they seem to get around. Um, there are also tree specialists um, in the sense that they almost always in this country roost in trees. In Europe, actually, often they roost in buildings, but that doesn't seem to be the case over here. Um, and the maternity colonies frequently change roosts, splitting, splitting up into smaller uh, colonies and moving into different trees and then coming back together again, sort of fission fusion uh, behavior. Um, so it tends to be the roost areas that are important for this species rather than the individual trees themselves. So let's move on. Right, so uh, their close association um, with humans has 
uh, cause problems for bats. There are a lot of factors that can uh, affect bat populations. Uh, some of these are, are major, for example, climate change, uh, which is uh, an ongoing um, issue for wildlife other than, than bats. Um, but because they occupy houses and they come into close contact with us, um, frequently uh, a lot of the issues are, are things that are within our control. Uh, Fiona has spoken about lights and inappropriate uh, lighting around houses. Um, in the top left corner here, you'll see another issue, which is breathable roofing membrane. Uh, so this is a modern membrane that uh, replaces the traditional bituminous felt. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it has a layer of microfilaments sandwiched between the inner and outer layer of the roofing felt. And back claws are just seem to have evolved specifically to pull out these membranes. So you tend to get this fluffing of the felt. Um, and this is, is actually in the maternity uh, roost for brown long eards. And this is a bat skeleton, uh, the remains of a bat that's become tangled up in this fluffed membrane uh, and has become trapped and died as a result of that. Um, another issue is loft insulation. So in the, in the top right here, um, Loft insulation has uh, two problems. I think if you install it in, uh, without knowing how bats access your loft, you can inadvertently block entrances. Um, but interestingly, sheep's wool insulation seems to have the same properties as a uh, breathable roofing membrane. It has long fibers, which are quite tough. And this is a naturalist pup, which has fallen onto the, or flown down onto the sheep's wool insulation and become entangled uh, in the fibers and died. Um, Sometimes, uh, through no fault of our own, bats simply gain access to parts of buildings um, and become trapped. So in the bottom right, we have, uh, unfortunately, a collection of dead pipistrelle pups um, that have managed to get into the inside of a service area in a, in a public loo, um, which hasn't been uh, visited for a while. By the time they were discovered, uh, they were either dying or dead. Um, if they emit alarm calls, they tend to attract other bats in. So the adults, uh, in this particular instance could have uh, may have come down but could have easily flown away and, and got out of the buildings but the, the juveniles are not adept enough to do that. Um, another issue is people uh, dealing with uh, insect infestations in their in their roof space. So here we have a smoke bomb um, which will kill insects incredibly well uh, as well as anything else that's in the loft such as bats. Um, other problems which uh, Fiona has had first-hand experience of uh, are the use of sticky traps for, for rodents and uh, fly papers, which uh, catch um, flies. The bats come to investigate and, and get stuff on the paper and uh, can also die. Um, another issue is cats. Um, a, a fairly recent uh, paper um, there's been quite a lot of anecdotal evidence about the impact of cats on wildlife and bats, but um, it has been found that they can account for up to a third of bat casualties brought into wildlife rehabilitation centres. Um, so the bats, uh, this is actually uh, a cat that I used to own, now, now long dead, um, which mainly was lived in the house, hardly went out. Um, I'll say what all cat owners say, I never saw catch anything. Um, we never saw it catch anything. The only thing it ever caught was a bat when it was sitting by an open window at night. Uh, the bat flew up to a roost and it just happened to come within poor reach. Um, fortunately, we managed to get to the bat before it, it uh, was too badly damaged. Um, so the Bat Conservation Trust recommend that you keep cats in at night, or if you can't do that or don't want to do that, at least keep them in um, just before sunset until about an hour after sunset, which is the peak emergence time. And particularly if you do have a maternity colony of bats in your property, keep your cats in between mid-June to the end of August. This is the time when the bats, young, when the mothers are um, lactating and, and key to the bat survival and when the young bats are learning to fly and are not very adept and very vulnerable to predation. If you want to find out more about bats, then the Exmoor Society is running a bat walk in Horner Wood uh, on the 8th of September. Um, the Bat Conservation Trust, a really useful source um, of information and advice. Uh, they also uh, run the National Bat Helpline if you have a problem that their information sheets online can't help you with, particularly if you're a householder um, wanting to 
install loft insulation or to treat timbers or you have an issue with a grounded bat. Um, and they run the National Bat Monitoring Program, uh, whereby um, people go out and monitor roosts or, or do transects and, and count numbers of bats. And this has been quite helpful in contributing to um, knowledge about um, bat populations within the UK. Um, or you could join your local bat group. For example, the Somerset Bat Group, there are several bat groups in Devon. Uh, this is a great way to get out and actually see bats up close. They do bat box checks, they have bat box walks, um, you can raise funds for bats. So if you want to be involved, then I'll def definitely recommend contacting your local bat group. Thanks very much. <laughs>